What's up, what's up, what's up, family? I am a determined black man, Judge, and as usual, I'm determined to reach at least one someone that's listening to the sounds of my voice, if not each and every one of you all. On today. to have another brief discussion with you all another brief discussion with you all rather and as usual you know I, I like to reach and touch on topics that um are very um instrumental to the growth of black people and i also like to uh actually shine light on things that are detrimental to the health and growth and development of black people but on today in specific i want to talk about Something that I know a lot of black people love to hear because they think about the money that we can put in our pockets. So you probably already figured that out. I want to speak briefly about reparations. Reparations for black people to be specific. Because if any of you all have done your homework, any of you all have done your research, any of you all that know anything about reparations, which it should be about more than just money. But let me say this. If any of you all know anything about reparations in the United States, then you know that every other suffering group of people other than blacks have had some form of reparation paid to them or their descendants. You know what I'm talking about. Y'all all know what I'm talking about, man. Fighting 400 steel, fighting to this day. To this those day. who are asking uh, for reparations for colonialism, and they're wondering, you know, $100 billion, $24 billion here and there, $500 million there. Some people want to be paid back, and, uh, and members of the public are wondering, why are we suffering when you are, you know, you have all of this vast wealth? Those are legitimate concerns. Well, I think you're right about reparations in terms of if people want it, though, what they need to do is you always need to go back to the beginning of a supply chain. Where was the beginning of the supply chain? That was in Africa. And when across the entire world, when slavery was taking place, which was the first nation in the world that abolished sla uh, slavery? The first nation in the world to abolish it. It was started by William Wilberforce, was the British. In, in Great Britain, they abolished slavery. 2000 naval men died on the high seas trying to stop slavery why because the african kings were rounding up their own people they had them on cages waiting in the beaches no one was running into africa to get them and i think you're totally right if reparations need to be paid we need to go right back to the beginning of that supply chain and say who was rounding up their own people and having them handcuffed in cages absolutely that's where they should start and maybe i don't know the descendants of those families where they died at the, in the high seas trying to stop the slavery that those families should receive something too i think at the same time it's an interesting discussion hillary thank you very much i appreciate it theme that it is the people who were enslaved that have all the responsibility here in terms of um, paying reparations in these kinds of contexts so France needs to pay that money back with interest. Uh, it's absolutely ridiculous. And we know the ways France has been involved with uh, subverting and uh, oh, let's go ahead and call it assassinating leaders on the African continent um, and how that has also um, affected, slowed, been a barrier to growth and development there. Yet there's this narrative going around that people are trying to sell, especially as reparations in America and with CARICOM uh, increases its momentum and its public support, both among the descendants of the enslaved as well as among regular folk who understand that when you build a nation uh, based on slave wealth and you deprive those people of citizenship rights, wealth accumulation, and the like, you are indebted to those people to repair the harm that has been so, caused. If we the Japanese have been compensated for their disparities during World War II. Um, of course, the Native Americans, the Indians have been compensated with land, uh, land grants, uh, monthly stipends. Uh, who else? Uh, there's been several groups of people to come to the Americas that have been paid. Actually, um, America forced Haiti to pay back, which is funny to me, to pay back um, slave masters for the land that they had to, to give back over to the slave. And so Haiti, Haiti ended up having to pay the slave owner for the land that should have been already originally theirs anyway. But uh, that's just another one of those things that come along with being black, you know what I'm saying? Not only that, you know, there were several promises that we were made. Uh, there was a general that made a promise to us uh, during the presidency of uh, Abraham Lincoln that blacks would receive at least 40 acres in a mule. That was like 400,000 acres designated to black people. 
And of course, like no other group of people, blacks once again get the short end of the stick because there was a check that was written, uh, but it came back insufficient. So uh, we, we still suffer. And so a lot of people, which makes me mad when I hear people that ain't going through the things that black people have to deal with, don't know the repercussions, which is crazy, of being black. Like because of their privilege, they just can't fathom that black people suffer at the hands of other people. The first thing most of these people want to always bring up is black on black violence, which is at an all time high and increasingly so. But what they fail to bring up also is the fact that a lot of this violence, a lot of this hatred, a lot of this anger has derived, first of all, from not knowing your roots and not knowing from which you come. Therefore, we are lost people and we searching. And so in the midst of our search, there are going to be a lot of people that are going to lose hope and become hopeless. And when you are hopeless, when you don't have no hope or nothing to hold on to and nothing that you feel like is certain, then you become cold hearted. You become, your heart gets hardened. You get, you get grudgy. You know what I'm saying? You become mad, mad and easily angry. But see, only someone that has dealt with these things, like just waking up and walking out your front door, it might become a statistic because of police brutality and the hate for black men in America. Just simply because he's black is real. You know what I'm saying? In, in, in the actual in actuality, it strips away your ability to build as a man. It makes it that much more difficult. You know what I'm saying? The, the bootstrap mentality is not for us because black people have worked their asses off. We built you all, we built this country. We built everything. We've actually educated these people. And even in that aspect, they want to strip it away and hide away our histories in other foreign countries. See, so first of all, the reason why a lot of us are the way that we are is still due to the fact that you all did something to us that you won't even you won't even begin to hold a conversation about. Yeah, there's a few states that have done some research, and even in California, which had one of the lowest uh, slave counts in America. So it's crazy that they can go, which would probably make it easier because they had fewer slaves, so it wouldn't cost them as much. But the fact that they have already started creating, uh, they have started creating policy and reparation talk. What do we want? Win! Thursday, a historic hearing at the state capitol. California's reparations task force releasing its nearly 1,200-page report. We're going to make sure that our descendants will be able to consult this great document and see the evidence that this state has committed the crime against black folks and it's time for them to pay their crime bill. After three years of fact-finding and public hearings, the task force is handing over to state lawmakers their recommendations to address the lingering negative effects of slavery and anti-black racism. They include over-policing, housing discrimination, and disparities in health care that contribute to shortened lifespans. It's not a handout. It is not charity. It is what was promised, what was owed, and what is long overdue. The report recommendations provide us the tools to reconcile this truth, to course correct, to repair the harm, and to finally begin to heal. The report includes more than 100 policy proposals, including a formal apology to descendants of people enslaved in the U.S., and financial compensation for harms descendants have suffered. And while the report doesn't issue a concrete dollar amount, a black Californian, at least 71 years old, who can trace their lineage back to an enslaved person could get up to $1.2 million in cash payments. People say, how can we pay for this? We just, we just passed a $300 billion budget in California. If we just put, listen, if we just put 0.5% of our budget into annuity annually. That's $1.5 billion a year we can pay for. it. Governor Gavin Newsom signing off on the nine-member panel three years ago. Now it's up to lawmakers to put the recommendations into action. You've given us a brilliant foundation um, for going forward. It's funny to me because the states that benefited the most off of slavery aren't even better eye towards reparations. As a matter of fact, I ride through a lot of these towns where I'm from, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, you know, local facilities of where I'm from. And I see, I still see plantations wide open. And I'm willing to, if I could check the books, which this is a, this is a video coming soon, I'm telling y'all, I'm doing some research. I just got to be careful how I do it. Uh, when you're dealing with what I'm dealing with, y'all, you have to be very careful because uh, 
we already know the inequality. But a lot of y'all may or may not be hip to the fact that uh, brutality is still real. You know what I'm saying? And these folks will hide your ass. You know what I'm saying? These folks that do something to you, you'll mysteriously come up missing. Because you're exposing hundreds and hundreds of years of secrecy or things that they, they didn't want other people to, to be enlightened. You know what I'm saying? And a lot, you know, and it's not the government because the government knows. The government actually assisted, assisted in a lot of these plo ploys towards black people. So that's why I don't look for the government to save us. The only someone that can save black people is black people. But I'm, I'm asking the government to do their part to help close the racial gap, to help close the racial wealth gap. Because I, I don't feel, unless uh, it's a, a miracle from God, that it will actually happen, that the gap will actually become closed. But I just want to be able to have the opportunity, the same opportunities as our white counterparts. You know what I'm saying? Going forward. I want to have the same rights to loans. I want to have the same rights, to, you know what I'm saying, for, for, for housing. I want to have the same rights, for, you know what I'm saying, to have opportunity for the liberty and justice and freedom and, and, and pursuit of happiness. I want it to be fair. I don't want you to just have it in policy, it's, which is another reason why I tell black people to stop voting for parties. Stop voting because they're Republicans or they're Democrats. Vote because they have your best interests at heart. Check their policies. Check what have they done already. Stop voting based off a blank check. I just told you they wrote us a check. But then they went back and re, uh, redressed it and took it off the table. Once they got us all excited about it, then they went back and took it off the table. So what was the point? They like to get black folks all excited about nothing. And then still work their ass off to make them everything, which leaves you still with nothing. So black people, I commend you all for any of you all that's taking heed, any of you all that's taking what I'm saying serious, any of you all that's already taking the ball and going score that layup, go and shoot that three, go and slam dunk. You know what I'm saying? Everybody can't slam dunk. Someone just got to lay it up. But if you just do your part, even if you just pass the ball, just pass the rock. You know what I'm saying? I commend any of you all that are team players, any of you all that, that realize that the only way that we're going to become sustainable as a community is, is if we come together and unite. Since last August, since last August, we have received 17,000, over 300 buses. And as it stands right now, as it stands right now, we have almost 10,000 migrants, asylum seekers, that we have sheltered here in the city of Chicago. Okay. This park has served me and my family for many years. Thank you. My name is Michelle Zappalo and I should be on the list, probably like number 10 or so. Um, but my question to you is, if we shut this park down, for the people that bring their kids here for sports programs, where are they supposed to go? Let me and I and let me go and let me answer that for you. I have an eight-year-old. He's been out here since he's been six. We have so many of uh, this. This sports program goes up to 13 U. A lot of these young boys, they don't have fathers. So a lot of these coaches, they are their fathers. They are their father figures. They come to this community four days out of the week: Tuesday, Wednesday. Saturday for game day and Fridays. So they spend part of their weekend here alone during the week that keeps them a safe place. It gets them mentorship. It shows them discipline. It shows them how to be raised as black men in the community. So you sit up here and you move our kids out when we already don't have the resources as it is. My son also goes to Wicker Park. I haven't got an email about nobody setting shelter up in Wicker Park. But yet we come in a community of black people where we already get the low scraps. And then you want to take the little scrap, the resources that we have, and put us at the bottom of the barrel? That's not fair. And I won't have it, because my son will be here. Everybody else is against us. So that's why I say I don't, I don't look for the system to save us. And reparations ain't all about money. But it is. Because not only do you owe me them 40 acres and a mule, but let's think about the compounded interest. Let's think about how, how much interest uh, the owners of these enslaved people, how much they benefit in property, and over time, over hundreds of years, how much of that money would have compounded from millions to billions? For the first time, I think, in, in the history of the Congress, there was actually a, a hearing that was held on H.R. 40 and the concept of reparations, which essentially 
would allow for, you know, a, a bipartisan commission to really study the question of the journey that African Americans have been on in this country, you know, from slavery through Jim Crow, institutional racism, the legacy of it, and to figure out um, how America can come together behind the solution and what that would look like. But to also make sure that the record, you know, is clear. Mm -hmm. Because for a lot of folks, it's not. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's slavery and it's it's the legacy of slavery as well. You know, African Americans were largely carved out of the New Deal. So you had, mm -hmm. you know, the depression and a response to it, but a response to it that only applied to some Americans, not all Americans in certain instances. And then you had the greatest middle class in the history of the world built as part of American exceptionalism mm -hmm. in the aftermath of World War II. A large part of that was the GI Bill. African Americans fought in World War II. You know about the Tuskegee Airmen and others just as courageously as others. I mean, you had the president parading the Tuskegee Airmen the other day. Mm -hmm. But African Americans in large measure were cut out of the GI Bill. And so part of what helped to build the greatest middle class in the history of the world didn't apply. So you had this long journey that I think is part of the historical record. Nobody can factually dispute it. And then the question is, what does it all mean for the conditions that many communities still find themselves in right now? And so I think that's part of the concept of H.R. 40. There was a lot of free labor, y'all. And a lot of people died. So you can't really put a price on those lives. But we need compensation. We need something. Because then you give us the argument about none of us actually being enslaved. But we are. We're slaves to this system. We're slaves to an oppressive system that targets black people. For incarceration. Redlining, keeping us out of certain neighborhoods. And yeah, oh yeah, let's not forget in World War II when all those uh, black soldiers came back uh, and thinking that because of those promissories that they were given, the GI Bill, government issue, they weren't given their government issue. When they got back, they found out that they couldn't get those same loans as their white counterparts. They couldn't get those loans for, 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 for real estate, which also helps to build wealth over time. Do you know how big that is? It took away our ability to buy housing, which not only would help house us and give us shelter, but also, everybody knows that most properties appreciate with value, more so than anything. Real estate is the, the way to build wealth. It took away our ability. You know what I'm saying? And even if we go back into slavery, and when and when, when slaves were, were granted freedom per se, due to the Emancipation Proclamation, they still had to go back and farm these farms. And, the, and, 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 and they still had to give their land back up. They still lost land that was given to them. It was still a, a system that was put in place to help overturn the land back and give it back to the masters and give it back to the white people that had already oppressed them for hundreds of years. So at what point do the, do the black man have any chance or a fair opportunity to win? Because even when they know that they have systems and laws and policies against us, they still tell us it's just out of our sheer might that we got to pull ourselves together and put ourselves back in a position to be able to win. When, by all means, just about everything that they've got to put them in the position and predicament that they're in has been stolen from primarily from us. The story of Bruce's Beach is a story about what could and should have been. Over 100 years ago, an industrious black woman in Southern California dreamt of owning a beach resort, but was refused whenever she tried. Willa Bruce eventually acquired land in Manhattan Beach, telling the Los Angeles Times in 1912, I own this land and I'm going to keep it. She and her husband Charles built a lodge, a place where black vacationers could enjoy a stay at the beach. You know, they were, they were having a beautiful time and, and they built it to share. Yeah, and you know, because whenever uh, people came to California, they wanted them to have somewhere to go. When I think about Charles and Willa Bruce, I think about entrepreneurs, I think about black excellence, I think about community. The reality is the Bruces and their patrons were wealthy.
A stately photo of the Bruces on their wedding day, decked out in finery, foretold the makings of a power couple. The display of black success outraged the white neighbors and powers that be, says attorney George Fothery. In the light of harassment, intimidation, violence, um, their business just got more and more successful. And until the city of Manhattan Beach hatched a scheme to take the property via a racially motivated eminent domain. The Bruce's dream was stolen. Their property essentially seized for a pittance in compensation and only after they sued. This is it. I would say from right here to maybe this building here. Community this. activist Kavon Ward first learned of the Bruce's a few years after she moved to Manhattan Beach in 2017. You know, this country often tells us that we're black people, that we're lazy or we don't work hard enough or all we have to do is pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. And here we are in the 19 teens and the 1920s and this black couple did exactly that only to have their land stolen and to die as cooks in someone else's kitchen when they had this whole beachfront resort here. Ward began campaigning for the land to be returned to the descendants of Willa and Charles Bruce during the summer of 2020. Less than two years later, she succeeded with the help of Fothery. For a century, our government at every level has enacted policies uh, to dispossess black people of the right to own property and create wealth. And what was so powerful about the return of the property of the Bruce family is we see a path forward to finally counter some of those false oh, narratives. Less than a year after the land was returned, the four recipients of the land decided to sell it back to the county for nearly $20 million. As an attorney, um, my responsibility is to advocate in the interests of my clients. Um, as a citizen as an, and as an African-American citizen, um, I think that's an important question. Um, you know, who are the benefactors of restitution, who should be the benefactors of reparations. After her work getting the Bruce's their land back, this is not the outcome community activist Kavon Ward wanted. I wanted to see strong young black entrepreneurs like Charles and Willa Bruce take up space here and be able to build and develop here like the Bruce's once were able to do. Community is what got the land back. So yes, the family won, but the community did not. Our families were separated. Do you know that? I think it's like one out of five, every one out of five children was sold off from their families. Something like one out of every three fathers was sold off from their families doing slavery. Do you know how harsh that is? Do you know how harsh that is over time? You know what I'm saying? Us being so far and distant and, and broken up, we was already taken away and, and, and put in a foreign place and then you take and break us up from our, our leaders, our, our fathers, and then not only that, you rape our women and impregnate them. You tell us it's against the law for us to learn and how to read. Then when you do allow us to, you got to be the one to create the, 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 the laws and the uh, regulations and, and also the curriculum. You know, something that I tell y'all a lot about HBCUs. Still got to adhere to the curriculum or the regulations of the master. So don't be so, so ain't, ain't knocking you, but don't be too proud of your master's degree. Anyway, I just wanted to talk about reparations, man, because I feel like it's time to re be reimbursed, man. I feel like we're still suffering when, you know, we shouldn't be this, this bad off. We shouldn't be this far, you know, down to the point where black folks don't have nothing. Let's just be real. And every time we get a little something, we get puffed up because we ain't used to having nothing. And every time that we have shown the resilience and the ability to actually build our own and create our own, what, do you, what happens? Everybody knows what happens. You destroy it. You take it away. You come up with policies and ways to try to imprison us and to dehumanize us. The black man is still treated as three-fifths human. A dog on the streets gets more love than a black man in America. I'm not speaking out of racism. I'm not speaking from a, a racist point of view. I'm speaking from a righteous point of view and a real point of view and things that I have had to deal with myself things I continue to have to deal with. And the reason why, the main reason why I am so adamant about trying to bring awareness and attention to these issues is because I got sons and daughters that's, that's growing up out here. 
I got sons and daughters that's, that's, that's being raised out here in this society that ain't got no love for them. And so I'm trying to encourage black people to regain the love for one another because that's what we need and that's the only way we're going to succeed. The only way we're going to succeed. Can't nobody else do it for us, y'all. Black people got to do it. I'm going to read this right quick, y'all. I'm going to let y'all go. Um, this is an article from 2022 and it's coming directly from the New York State Bar Association. It's by David Howard King. He says that the United States government around the world have paid reparations even when they had no part in the inflicting damage. So why is it that black Americans haven't been compensated for centuries of slavery followed by decades of segregation? See, that's the other part. You know what I'm saying? Not only did we have to endure slavery, but you also had to endure Jim Crow and segregation. And not that segregation was a bad thing, but the fact that it still kept us out of everything, you know what I'm saying? Then we weren't allowed to be able to help ourselves, as they say, to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps because we weren't able to go to those private institutions and get those degrees that you all said that we had to get to get that, you know what I'm saying, that, that professional job and make those um, commas, those extra zeros. So therefore, we were, we were, we were, we were set back. And so, uh, he says, um, this was the question addressed by a panel of experts brought together by the New York State Bar Association Task Force on Racism, Social e Equity, and the Law on Monday night. Well, of course, this was back June 17, 2022, so you do the math on, the, on that. The discussion took place two days after 10 people were gunned down in a supermarket in a black neighborhood in Buffalo by a white supremacist who squalled, here's your reparations on his assault rifle. Wow. The yeah, I knew the story, but every time I hear it, it just makes me sick for the simple fact, well, not just the fact that he killed all these black people and that, uh, that black security guard that uh, was on to something as far as uh, creating cars or some, a motor that didn't have, that, that could run out of water, a hydrogen motor. And he was gunned down. But not only that, but this white supremacist, it's obvious that he was white supremacist, to, to, to be walked out alive and able to put his gun down. When so many of us, you know, we, we can't even hold our hands up good before we gun down inside of our own vehicles. But anyway, uh, they said the discussion took place after the, uh, the, the, the supremacist killed these black people in the supermarket. And um, he had, uh, here's your reparations written on, his, on, his, on the barrel of his rifle. Arthur A. Christian Mullion pointed out that the United States government has paid reparations to Japanese families who were interned during World War II. Families who lost loved ones during September 11 attacks and to America's held hostage in Iran. The federal government even paid reparations to slave owners for the emancipation of their slaves in the midst of civil war. Wow. Slave owners. That's what I told y'all. Slave owners even benefited once again off of slaves. <laughs> Thomas Premier Associate professor at the School of Public Policy in the University of Connecticut detailed how Germany reimbursed victims, victims of the Holocaust and how Haiti was forced to pay reparations to slave owners. Remember I just told y'all that? <laughs> That's crazy. That's insane. Yet reparations paid to families of, of the enslaved remains extremely controversial. Why is it so damn controversial? But you can find the, right, the, 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 the means and the ways to pay everybody else. Albany Law School professor Anthony Paul Farley, a former federal prosecutor, said that May be, that may be due to the fact that the system of oppression that shackled and demeaned black Americans remains in place. Even if checks were cut tomorrow for the highest amount you could imagine, there are procedures in place for white power to recoup it all the day after tomorrow, said Farley, unquote. Farley described how black Americans face higher arrest rates, lower wages, and a more fragile, or fragile economic existence than their white counterparts. He attributed that to systemic defamation by the United States government of black America. Right. So even if I'm trying to do my very best out here, even if I'm trying to do my very best out here, guess what? The United States and white supremacists have already given black people such a bad name that even before I get a chance to apply or even before I get a chance to, to walk in the building to, to apply, I'm already getting stared down. I'm already getting those, those, dead, those death stares, those looks that there's something wrong with me or that I don't deserve to be here. Our government has a way of teaching everyone black people's place in society, he said. We as lawyers are all familiar with reparational harm. We know what defamation is. We know what it costs if you have a bad name. Black people got a bad name, and it ain't all our fault. And it's because that we've been given this bad name and, and not allowed the same opportunity as others. The reason why we acting out the way we acting so that you all can still point your finger and say, that's why we're not helping them, because look at them, they animals. They three-fifths of a man. No, you treat anything like an animal for so long, then yes, it becomes animalistic. Ask those guys in, in prison, incarcerated. It's a lot of guys that went in one way and may or may not come back, but if they do, they won't come back the same and it won't be for better, it'll be for worse. 
if they do return because they ain't teaching them nothing they ain't really showing them and they ain't correcting them and they wasn't intended to correct them. you know and it says but we don't think of the ways our government has for all these years been busy producing a bad name for black people black people have such a bad name that before a black person even gets to a job interview or walks into a dealership to buy a car or walks down the street way before they have ever arrived there are myths and stories that have been formed around them and people have natural reactions to that it's just natural when you've heard all these bad things that you want to react towards those individuals or that group with negativity you're going to react towards them negatively that's right Barley said that defamation comes in the form of how the government sanctions slavery and then segregation and how the legal education legal education financial and medical system in the country treat blacks that's the legal system the education system yeah they don't let us in their schools like I said and there was another thing with the uh, with, with the GI bills we weren't able to, to, to get what we was promised we also weren't able to get into those schools we weren't able to get those loans we weren't able to get those uh, student loans or grant money the government issue that we were promised so therefore we, we, we couldn't get into those institutions that would, that would allow us to get the education that we need to succeed to get on to higher uh, you know levels in this thing so took away any ability the segregation of legal of the legal aspects the educational aspects the financial aspects we couldn't go into we can't go into the, to this day we can't go in these banks and ask them for nothing if you want five hundred dollars as a black man alone you got to give them ten thousand dollars worth of uh collateral oh. so you want ten thousand dollars just to loan me five hundred dollars worth you know and that's why we have been subjugated to the uh predatory loans as well but also not only have we been barred out of all of these institutions but then you take away our ability to be healthy because you, you bar us away from medical assistance because we don't have the ability to afford certain insurance and so this my people is where we got to start and it's real and i encourage you all right now to do anything you can donate find ways initiatives you know what i'm saying don't sit back and wait on nobody else to do it today you know what i'm saying y'all can jump into the comment section y'all can leave comments and um let me know how y'all feel what y'all think is a, it would be a, a positive way to uh to go in our government and demand reparations we can't we can't keep asking y'all we got to demand and we got to stand on something we got to stand on what we believe in and we got to let these people know we ain't voting for shit until we see something happen cut the checks and i ain't talking about no blank check and don't make them insufficient make right on it this report also says that William A. Darity Jr., a professor of public policy at Duke University, said that many Americans have come to see black suffering as a morally as morally correct. So people actually think that the suffering of black people is deserving of black people. That's crazy to me. That's absolutely insane. That there's another human being out here that could think that, that the way that black people are being treated is fair. And I know that there's people like that because uh, in my comments, I have a lot of people that comment oftentimes. Uh, basically trying to point the finger at black folks for the things that black folks are going through that's crazy to me and that's also scary to me that you can actually turn such a blind eye it says that 30 percent of the population will resist any positive social change on behalf of black people it's almost half of the, of, of the population almost half of the population is encouraged to keep black people right where they are now darity and mullen are, are both pro bono counsel to efforts in california to study reparations their conclusion from their involvement in this reparation must be made on a national level they say the scope of payments needed to address the wealth gap between white and black Americans eclipses even the largest scale budgets. Darity said that using the formula for four acres and a mule, which promised free slaves by General William T. Sherman during the Civil War, but later reversed by President Andrew Johnson, would necessitate a reparations fund of between one to three trillion dollars. However, Darity noted that four acres and a mule was only one way to measure reparations, and it fails to take into account centuries of negative actions taken by the U.S. government against blacks. This is only one component shaping the wealth gap. There are still consequences of discriminatory home ownership programs, the destructive effect on black businesses of the Federal Highway Program, and much more. Right, we've been bought out of all those government contracts that white people have been benefiting off of for years and centuries now. Aside from the sheer size of payments, Darity and Mullen said that tracing the descendants of slaves and singling out those responsible in one state is difficult. California, for example, only has a short history of slavery due to its being found later in the life of the nation. As Farley puts this, black Americans 
as a whole, regardless of their of whether they are descendants of slaves, have borne the brunt of racist, have borne the brunt of racist policies and government defamation. So it don't matter. If you're black in America, you'd have had to deal with the disparities of being black. It's being black in America. Asked where he would begin to implement reparations, Farley noted this credit his credentials as a former federal prosecutor before advocated for the abolition of prison and the police. We know prison doesn't make people better. We've essentially abolished prison for white people, and yet we inc incarcerate a higher portion per capita than Soviet Union, than apartheid South Africa. We incarcerate more per capita than the People's Republic and the People's Republic of China. <laughs> this is crazy. It says that chains look good on black people to most Americans. With that, y'all, I'm going to leave y'all. I love y'all. I hope that y'all stay up, stay home, stay good, good people. May y'all feel free to drop a comment in the comment section. Let me know how y'all feel. What do you all feel like we deserve as far as reparations? What do we need to do? Besides hey, everything I've told you, I already know. We need to come together. We need to unite. We got to come together and stand firm and affirmative on what we believe in. We can't have half and half people saying we deserve it and other people saying, nah, let's just get some policies in place. No, we need the monies and we need the policies. And that's a fact, Jack. So anyway... Y'all let me know, jump in the comment section. Please hit the like button if you like this message. And if you ain't subscribed to my channel, please subscribe. And hit the notification bell so you'll be notified each and every time I drop any high new content to this channel. Look, man, I'm all about my people. Look, I love everybody. I'm, I'm for the human race. But I got to be about my people first because my people are my people and my people are in a dire need for help. I love you all. I try to keep you all informed. I'm not trying to belittle any of you all, trying to make any of you all feel insignificant or, or, or stupid or dumb or none of that. I'm just here to try to help us think better and put, put topics on our mind that we really need to be uh, focused on rather than all the other distractions you know what I'm saying because it's been going on um, emperors been using the Colosseum and gladiators and different things to try to keep us keep you distracted whenever you start asking a lot of questions so uh, don't fall for the scheme of things y'all we gotta be smart kings and queens smart chiefs smart people we gotta be smart black women and men and raise our kids to be smarter and to understand and not only that don't fall for anything that ain't helping you stand Black people, I love you all. Y'all stay up. Y'all stay homeless. That good, good people. Until the next time, I'm out. What? You know what I'm talking about. Y'all all know what I'm talking about, man. Going and still fighting to this day. To this day.